salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Welcome everybody to the Safina Society, Nothing But Facts live stream where we are filming today uh, under unique circumstances from the New Brunswick Islamic Center back room with our guest, Dr. Yaqub Ahmed. Dr. Yaqub Ahmed is a history professor at Istanbul University. He's a fellow graduate from uh, the School of Oriental and African Studies. And today, uh, he's going to be talking to us about the historical critical method, which is a methodology in assessing fact from fiction, right, regarding the sources. Now, let me give you a summary. I like Jonathan Brown's summary in his book here, Hadith, where he talks about one of the biggest differences between the Muslims' approach towards history and the Europeans' approach towards history, is that the Muslims' approach towards history, it starts from the past, and it was critical from the get-go, and it passed on. And because it was so critical from the get-go, a lot of trust was established over time. In contrast, this was not the case for the early Catholic history or Christian history. As a result of that, around the time of the Renaissance, people started realizing, wait a second, we were duped. The, the, the donation of Constantine was a fraud. Trinity verse itself was a fraud. So much of the, orig, uh, of the core of our origins was a fraud. So the critical aspect of the history started way later, like we're talking 1,500 years after the origins of Christianity, right? The result of that is that the default starting point of anyone with a brain, anyone with a critical method or a critical approach is distrust in the origins of religious history. That is a massive difference. And that's what informs the mindset and the mentality of the critical historian towards resource uh, or, or uh, origins of religious histories or any past histories is distrust. You're being duped. And that never goes away. So when they take it to Islam, they apply it everywhere. They apply the same thing. It's very actually uncritical because you're taking my life story and applying it to your life, your life, your life, your life. That means if if my dad abused me, wow, I look at you and you're, oh, he must be abused. You must be abused. You must be abused. That's such an important uh, starting point. And from there, I'm going to give the mic over to Dr. Yaqub to expand on what I've been saying here. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, so this is an interesting point that you begin with because I want to just explain some of the challenges I had as a Muslim in, in, in Western academia, which was the fact that, as you mentioned, Dr. Shadi, one of the interesting things is there's an assumption by placing Islam with all the other religions that it's a one-size-fits-all, right? Mm-hmm. That every other experience is the same experience. That Islam is just like Christianity and all of these religions are the same. And actually this secular, secular religious tradition, I use that deliberately here um, is somehow a referee that can sort of like judge every other religious tradition in the way that it judged Christianity mm-hmm. and this is an interesting point because when we were when I was teaching once in in Turkey um, when we spoke about the Abrahamic faiths in within the framework of academia even that had a sort of like internalized idea in which Christianity was at the top and Islam was at the bottom a sort of hierarchy and so what happened, with, even within that framework, was that Islam was being judged and compared to another religious tradition. And so it was being scrutinized in the same way, not recognizing that Islam has its own tradition. It has its own tradition of scholarship, scrutiny, and the way that it was looking at the sources, right? Mm-hmm. And what was intriguing is when I noticed many of my Muslim colleagues and friends who were doing PhDs, by the way, um, that those of them who didn't have a interaction with the religious tradition themselves, those of them who were not aware of the robustness of their own tradition, those of them who were not aware of an alternative tradition of critical thinking, often started to have a crisis in faith because they were, or they didn't understand their own faith actually. And this was intriguing because a lot of people criticize um, people who did religious scholarship. And I noticed, that people who had a religious training when they came into the field of Islamic studies, 
they were cleaning up house, mm. right? So, it, I mean, they would get shocked. They said, mm. is this the state of academia? Is this how they're speaking about us? Yeah. It is, really? Because what you notice is actually the academic tradition in and of itself that we're looking at in terms of Western academia is only about 100, 200 years old. Mm -hmm. How old is the Islamic tradition? 1400 years. So in that sense, there's a depth to the tradition that we have and from the inception. And as Jonathan mentions, in terms of Hadith literature in particular, the type of scrutiny that ulama do in regards to handwriting, in, term, in terms of biographies, in terms of the Isnad, in terms of context, it's all there from the beginning. And that sort of like holistic understanding of evidences was there was a culture around it and there was a plurality. So when we say ulama, for example, ulama is interesting because it's, it's a plural term. And we use it as a plural. And what is important about why I'm explaining it's a plural, because no single one person could corrupt or compromise an idea about Islam without not being second guessed or second judged mm -hmm. or critiqued by somebody else. Do you know you what I mean? Utter a word. You couldn't get away with it. Yeah. So there was a form of pluralism within the Muslim world. Mm -hmm. And when this tradition from its inception is emerging, so I explained this, that one of the intriguing things about Islam is both the oral tradition and the written tradition simultaneously were being developed at the, at the same time, right? Yeah. And that's the robustness. And so that whole sort of like culture in the way that we self-identify, there's no weakness here. There's a strength here. It comes from that position. And because there's an absence in understanding the tradition on many occasions and overemphasizing the sort of arrogance and yet insecurity of Western academia, you start to see when Muslims go into academia having this mm -hmm. problem. Do you know what I mean? Let me uh, bring this up. For the audience that is maybe not aware of some of the basics here. Uh, transmitted knowledge, the assessment of transmitted knowledge is a rational enterprise, meaning journalism, history, hadith, essentially, it's the same thing. I want to know if the person telling me this information, the only source of the information is you telling me. Now I have to make sure that this is verified. Okay. So each, every historical um, methodology may have a presupposition. So the presupposition of Islam, there's only one, really one presupposition, which is that the Sahaba are not lying. That first original generation is established by the Quran, that they don't, they're, you can accept them. From there, everybody else can be interrogated. All right. The presupposition of the Renaissance uh, critical thinkers is that people of the past are lying to you. But beyond, question? Yeah, the the basis of the companions not telling lies is that they confirmed each other through tawatur, right. and they may have not known each other, they may have not uh, uh, even seen each other, right. some companions. So there is a rational component to the companions too. Uh, now, here's a question. What are the essential presuppositions of the Western tradition? Okay, that, that's a big question. Aside from what I said is that they look at the past with suspicion. Otherwise, all historical critical methods should be the same. They should be the same. I think what I've noticed, and this is why I wanted to raise the idea of secularism, is that within it there's an ingrained assumption about the religious tradition in the way to look at the religious tradition. And so it's already orientated the writer or the thinker of rejecting certain things mm -hmm. and accepting certain things. And so you get narrowed down as a thinker in terms of the possibilities of how you can think. So this sounds strange, but there's an assumption that it's just one form of rationality, mm -hmm. which is the Western form of rationality. There isn't, actually. I mean, rationality universally is the same. So I remember Mustafa Sabri Effendi, who was an alim in the Ottoman Empire, saying the beauty of rationality is the rationality of Adam alayhi salam is no different than the rationality of me. Yeah. And so we can both come to the same conclusion mm -hmm. that Allah exists. That is universal. Every single human being has that. That is a necessity. And by using that form of rationality, you can understand that there is a creator and you are created. But if you bypass that, if your form of rationality just rejects that first question and it comes down to a point where that first question is irrelevant and you, you have a disposition where in your idea of rationality that religion is irrelevant or religion is backwards or religion, all religions are the same or 
it reduces things. Naturally, then when you start to look at traditions, you're already looking at the tradition from a restric restricted Revalence. perspective. Revelence, exactly. Yeah. And one of the things that you highlighted, which is important, which is most of history is narrative. Yeah. It's narrative. When, when you look at the footnotes, very rarely do people scrutinize the footnotes in the way that we have the Isna tradition and we scrutinize those footnotes. F uh, footnotes, I mean, it's amazing when, when people pick up a book, right? right? right. They automatically assume yeah. great amount of thought. Right. And, and when there is footnoting, yeah. I mean, a footnote really is just one link. Right. Well, where did that footnote get his source from? Where did they get that source from? So what you said earlier, I want to summarize for everybody, is that rationality is the same universally. So if I went to Japan 5,000 years ago, if I went to Australia 4,000 years ago with Aboriginal people, if I went to Europe 3,000 years ago, Africa 2,000 years ago, and I went to the Middle East 1,000 years ago, Native Americans 500 years ago, you take a family. Someone comes in and says, there's a predator outside, be careful, mm -hmm. right? Don't go out today. Even though you need food and water, mm -hmm. don't go out because there's a wild predator running around. You're asking me to do something pretty big, to stay in my little hut, and I need food. So immediately, we have to verify that what you're saying is right. What if you're a competing fisherman, right? What if you're a competing uh, a hunter? So all, every human being has the same uh, thinking towards verifying this. So the historical method really should be the same. And let me tell you why uh, in Islam there's A, Early Islamic history, there is a, a stronger, uh, a, a finer uh, filter. Yeah. And B, that there was actually more diversity in Islam than there is in Orientalism. Number one, the Muslims are checking God's word and the Prophet's word. People can go to hell if you make a mistake. Yeah. Nowhere, very few other places is hell on the line. Mm -hmm. That's why the New York Times could publish stuff that for us would be like, if, if this was a, re a religious fatwa, it would never be, it w if this was a religious transmission, it would never pass. Right. Um, Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. Okay, where does your Senate go back to? One person. Okay, who's that person? Unknown, right? What did they call him? Some, they, they had a name for this person, right? The New York Times, the, be the supposedly top-rated institution for transmitting news to us, transmitted to us a hadith that was... Ahad, number one, and Mubham, number two. Mm -hmm. Mubham means hidden, hidden source. Number two, one source. And that was the justification for a war. Of course, the war was going to happen anyway. But that was the educated populace's, okay, at least the New York Times said it, right? Secondly, there is a great amount of diversity amongst the Muslims in accepting the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, namely, what is sahih to one is not to the another. A very simple example. Imam Malik did not accept at all the line that says birds with claws, that prohibiting uh, predatorial animals and birds with claws, Shafi'iyah accepted as the words of the Prophet. The Maliki say, Imam Malik said, no, birds with claws was an analogy given by the transmitter. So we have a great diversity that, of, of the hadiths, proof of being all the books on weak hadith, mm -hmm. fabricated hadith. So maybe you could talk about that. It's, it's oftentimes painted, the picture's painted that Muslims just accept whatever the Prophet said as long as you can string some names in a chain. Mm -hmm. But we actually are more diverse. When you go to the Western uh, his, uh, tradition, mm -hmm. it's almost like there's agreement that all hadith with the exception of Harold Motsky and Jonathan Brown, right? There's like agreement across the board. Hadith are all unreliable. What a coincidence. The lands of the colonizers, their scholars, bring us a conclusion that destroys for Islam from within. Like what a coincidence. Yet you don't find that with the, with the Muslims. With the Muslims, they interrogated. They discarded so many hadiths. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal said he memorized one million hadiths, which means chains, a million chains of all hadiths that cannot ever be relied upon mm -hmm. before he started studying the ones he could be relied upon. So if you can expand on the diversity of, of um, hadith acceptance what, in Muslim history. What's interesting, that's a really valid point. It's not, uh, first, let's look at the Sahaba themselves. So when 
hadith was heard by Sahaba or so forth, it was cross-examined even by themselves. Subhanallah, the right? themselves. So yeah. you can yeah. see yeah. in the hadith literature of, uh, like, did Rasul some say this or not? And you can see in the hadith literature, at times, some Sahaba saying he did, and some saying not so much. So what mm. you realize is even in that community at the time, from the inception, the culture is already established in that way, and that's important because why? Because they are scrutinizing the evidence mm-hmm. because they, it's a lived tradition. Yep. They live in tradition straight away. And they act away. upon it and they, there's heaven and right, based on it. Totally. And this is another valid point you made about um, the idea of, of punishment and the consequences. Which is the, and I've said this to you before, that when I'm writing as an academic, even now today, I'm concerned because of the culture of Islam that I come from, that there are consequences in the way I write. Mm-hmm. And that idea of feeling a sense of accountability beyond mm-hmm. the human accountability, beyond feeling a sense of shame or, mm-hmm. or ego or so forth, means you scrutinize the evidences further mm-hmm. and you give a sense of leeway. And so when we look at the ulama, as you said, they looked at it linguistically, they looked at it within context, mm-hmm. they looked at when it was revealed, they looked at who was in the chain, they looked at the possibility of this. Mm-hmm. So they, take, they took everything into consideration and even debated about it. And what's intriguing, on some matters they came to a consensus and some matters they said there could be a difference of opinion here and so on and still provided that particular form of flexibility. And even now, today, this Muslim community is equally as robust, is equally as diverse, is equally as plural and it looks at the evidences in exactly the same way. And that's what I think people don't recognize and don't appreciate in terms of how we do this. In terms of academia, what I find interesting, and Muslims do this all the time, they'll say, history says this. Mm -hmm. What do you mean history says this? What does that mean? What does that statement mean? And they take the idea that a book that they've taken from the shelf in a bookshop, written by an academic, is a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And for me as a historian, I said, well, did you scrutinize that? But it's written by an academic. And what's intriguing is they dismiss their own tradition without even looking at it and they don't scrutinize the books that they read in on an equal weight. Mm -hmm. So in the past, as you made the point about, I think the idea of Allah's existence is important first. The fact that the the Sahaba and the ulama were aware that there is a particular form of judgment that would be passed which makes, it stops you from being disingenuous. That's a presupposition right. that we don't negotiate on. Right, so as I told you before, I was in an academic forum, and one of the academics jokingly said it, but I believe that that was an intention, which is one of the great things about writing history is that people are dead, so they can't defend themselves. Mm-hmm. And that made me nervous. And I said, actually, one of the concerns I have as a Muslim writing history is because they can't defend themselves. Mm-hmm. And they will hold me accountable in the eyes of Allah Ta'ala. So you can see that in terms of this like critical method, um, that actually the way that we use the critical method comes from the culture of hadith literature. Mm-hmm. It actually comes from that culture of the way that we critique hadith literature, the way that different scholars in different parts of the world. So when you look at like Imam Ashri and Imam Maturidi, they are in different parts of the world, and yet they more or less coming to similar conclusions on certain matters mm-hmm. because of the way that you know, they, they're using a methodology of coming to the text. Now, there could be some nuances in methodology, but by and large, you know, you see a similarity. And that's what I find interesting. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, let me ask you the question that of identity and history. Right. If I'm looking at facts, right. uh, what stops me? Why should there be any objection? If I'm solely looking at facts, what's the objection of me documenting other people's history because we see that here that you made a point earlier in your tour this week people should write their own histories you, you people should tell their own story you have the right to tell your story nobody has the right to go tell my, I, I would probably take offense if someone wrote a biography about my family like you you don't even know us right so but if so, that person comes and says wait wait I'm just objectively writing making history based upon what would be an objection to that? And the lead would be that that needs to be the objection to non-Muslims writing Muslim history. But first we have to assess, is the obje- what is the grounds of the objection? So the first point about facts is interesting. Because in Western academia, we, pla- we place the idea of facts as being sacred. Mm-hmm. And that facts, to some degree, cannot be manipulated. Mm-hmm. 
facts can be manipulated. Because mm. facts, in essence, is just data that is then pl placed within an ideology story. and within a story, yeah. right? So before even understanding the idea of facts, it's important to teach the students the idea of ideology and narrative. So I always, we, we talk with my students in this way and say, listen, so certain atheists talk about the idea of the possibility of Rasul Salam going on a horse with wings. Mm -hmm. Now we have a difference of opinion in our own tradition about this. So I, I understand that. But the point I'm trying to make is, in the Western tradition, the idea is, we've never seen any horse with wings. There's no evidence of any horse with wings. There's no evidence of a horse can be able to do this and the other. Doesn't, we didn't find any bones. This is impossible. And yet, we say, is, I always ask my students, is Allah Ta'ala capable of doing that? They say yes. Okay, we have a different position on facts now. Yeah. So already you can see how this operates and works. I try to explain to my students that yes, there is a difference within the tradition. That's not the point. The point is, is that by, by them removing Allah in, from the equation, mm -hmm. they remove a huge component in the way you understand things. And that's just a basic example I'm giving for Muslims in that sense. But on many occasions, when we're writing narratives, you see that facts are manipulated, statistics are manipulated, numbers are manipulated in that sense. So that's the one point. But um, the second point about writing your own history is this. I was only telling the students this morning. When the Israelis occupied Palestine, they didn't only take away their land, take away their material wealth, take away their lives, they took away their memories. Mm. All right, so Palestinians uh, have been struggling for a long time again in opposition to the Israeli identity mm. but you had an identity before that mm. you had a history before that you had a history that goes back and what is it part of it's part of the Islamic history it's mm. part of the Islamic tradition many Muslim academics they, they want to talk about Islamic Jerusalem to make that point so that people understand and one of the most powerful things you can do for a group of people is not allow them to have the right to write about their own history and then to write their history for them. Mm -hmm. And power does that. It decides what it names and what it doesn't name. Mm -hmm. It decides what your identity is and isn't. And this is why I say for Muslims, the ultimate power is Allah. He named our deen Islam and he named us Muslim. So that gives us our sense of identity. But when you see in academia in particular, these are, everyone else, is right, and it's not uh, here for me. It's not about Muslims only. We have Muslims in academia, but they're still writing from a perspective, mm. which is not helpful for Muslims or the Palestinians in that sense. It's a great point that you make, and and I want to say, it's one of the genius moves by the Israelis, mm -hmm. to promote a new Palestinian identity based on this flag that never existed before whatever the fifties. Right. Uh, and even that name, Palestinian, was something that also is relatively modern. You were just from Ahl al-Sham, you were Quds, from, from al Quds al-Maqdisi or something like this. You were, you had a, a, a broader base, you had a, a longer history. And to put them in a box makes it so powerful because now I grow up, let's say from Palestinian, I grow up and my identity is just a rebel, a stone throwing rebel. Right. Like, I don't have a rich history before this. So we have to interrogate just that fact that you call, the, just this word Palestinian and that flag. Now, maybe, of course, most people don't think too deeply about it. Right. But wait a second, where were your great-great-grandfather? How did he view himself? He didn't view himself as a Palestinian who's against the Israelis. He viewed himself as something far greater. That's right. And that's really important. And that goes to summarize your critique is that there is no such thing as somebody going and just looking at the facts. Every historian, you are not an AI bot. You are a human being. AI can't even do that because it has to be filtered. Someone's got to give the AI its, its instructions, right? Still, there's a human being behind that. That human being has beliefs, has emotions, most importantly has motives, right? He has a motive. And we say about this is that we interrogate the historian first before we interrogate his facts before we interrogate your book and your conclusion we're interrogating you yeah. and we're asking what is your motive can you outline for us your intent right, right. we say in the I'm, the prophet taught us actions are my intentions and this is why i always say it's not far-fetched it's not unprofessional to ask motive yeah. 
every introduction of a book should be what's your motive. When I look at an Orientalist, I ask, mashallah, look at that good deed that was done by Waj. Coming in with the, with the coffee. Unbelievable. Uh, when I look at a motive, okay, or a historian, an Orientalist, and I say, hold on a second. You just spent about 10 years doing graduate studies. This is not your faith. You don't believe in it. You're getting nothing spiritual out of it. You're getting nothing political out of it. This is not a pre-conquest study that you're doing here. You're not making money out of this. Right? Thank you very much. What is the... What, 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 what's the latest on salaries of, of a, of a SOAS historian or... Even let's take the highest level. The highest level is what? 150K? 120K? Right? You're not making money. What do you do with 150K and 120K? Right? Like, what do I do with that? Right? But after taxes, after wife, after kids, after rent, after, after mortgage, you got nothing. So I, I should think, I should really ask the question what the heck are you doing? Why are you doing this? So we interrogate the motive. What is your motive? There's no way you're spending all that time and all that effort on no profit, no wealth, no power, not even social, like you're not even like uh, famous. Like a YouTube star can make no money, but he's, he trended, right? And people recognize him. You don't get that. You don't get anything. You cannot tell me, oh, I'm just interested. Oh, it's just, uh, it's fascinating. Oh, it's compelling i'm not buying that so your point basically is saying that the historian himself has a motive and that's going to lead and that which is why we are not going to accept nobody will accept a a a a a a cabal of uh outsiders from our tradition to write our history and tell us who we are so from the get-go you are x'd there's an x on you as a historian, before you bring, because we don't believe in facts alone. Facts are welded into a story, right? Okay, now let's, this brings me to the other point. Islamic history is oftentimes perceived as the study of Muslims, right? Well, that's not, we can't, that's, that's really shallow. And I'm going to put forth three possibilities and you tell me where they stand. Where you stand on this. True, the usul of Islamic history has to ask the question of to whom are we accountable? What is our purpose of doing this? To truly be Muslims writing history. Number three, what are the rights of the subject? Mm -hmm. Muhammad al-Fatih, he has hukuk. Mm -hmm. If I'm writing about Salah al-Din Ayyubi, he has hukuk. Mm -hmm. These are dead people. Like you said, that guy, he said, oh, it's a good thing write history about they're all dead, right? Mm, not for us. They're dead for us, but they have hukuk. Their creator is watching and will resurrect everyone to judge. So these are three principles. Now, I want you to comment on those principles. Usul kitab al-tariq. Usul al-mu'arrikhin. Usul al-tariq, right? Again, I'm going to repeat them. Who is the ultimate judge of this history? Is it a panel of other peer reviews? Right, a peer review panel. Number two. What is the purpose of this? Why are we doing this? Number three, the rights of the subject. That's a great question, actually. Um, those three points are not just restricted to history writing. It's to ilm itself. And when a person, especially a Muslim, understands that those three components are necessary for the one who's doing ilm, mm -hmm. then they can write an ilm which is it's far more, what I would say, accountable and it, it, it's framed within the framework of humility because you become a truth seeker. Mm -hmm. And in our deen, and I said this before, we're, we're, we're truth seekers and we're truth speakers, right? So if in your everyday life, and ilm is not just about abstract ideas that go into books, Islam is a lived tradition. So the idea of ilm is that you're aware that there is a, Allah Ta'ala exists and you're held accountable to that. If in your everyday life you're aware of this accountability, when you're writing something, creating knowledge, 
of people who cannot defend themselves, the, the best thing you can do in our tradition is to give them a fair trial. Mm-hmm. For example, if a brother comes to me and his, or a sister comes to me and says, I want to get married to this guy, what's your opinion? Mm-hmm. You don't just start trashing this person if you don't like them. You try to be as fair as possible and, and you have a particular mannerism, a particular behavior, a particular adab, and you're aware also that you're being held accountable to, in the eyes of Allah Ta'ala. One of the mistakes that many Muslims make is they think just because a person doesn't exist anymore, that we're talking about them like we're watching a movie. Yeah. And say, listen, people, relax, be careful. Be careful what you're doing. Mm-hmm. So when I wrote my PhD, I was very nervous. I would sit there because I had loads of names in there. Mm-hmm. Ulama, Sultan Abdul Hamid II, people. Mm-hmm. And my concern was, you're leaving Sadaqa Jariya behind. Is it Sadaqa Jariya? Mm-hmm. Is it? And on the day of judgment, all of these people will line up and say to Allah, well, actually, he lied about me. Mm-hmm. He wasn't there. So then I got nervous. So I told you before, in the beginning, and Allah knows best, the mechanism to try to safeguard myself in that sense. And I think for Muslims, this is not just an idea of how they judge the past. This is how they should behave with their fellow brethren when they live. And this is a really valid point you make, that on every aspect they do, that are they being held accountable to Allah Ta'ala? Yeah. How are they speaking? And what's the point of it? So you can go into every single detail of one's life and, and start pulling it out. But is that how we operate? Is that how we want to be? And I've been called, I remember I was in an academic forum and a guy said to me, you're just biased because you're Muslim. And I said, no, our viewpoints are different. You're, you're under the assumption that because you're not Muslim, that you have an authority to speak to me as being objective. Yeah. Because your mechanism tells you that that's what being objective is. I said, no, no way, no chance. Yeah. Our, our viewpoints are different. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about my community. You're not. And, but you think that, that your position is more valid than mine. Mm-hmm. I reject that. I reject that. And I tell them all the time. I remember, sorry to keep going. No, keep going. We were talking about the ulama once. And they were saying, you know, the ulama, this, 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 and this. And in, in, in history. And I sat there in the workshop and I listened. And then I stuck my hand up. I said, have any of you like met any ulama? Yeah. They went, no. <laughs> and I said, so um, do you know that many of these people who you talk about in our tradition, uh, they feared Allah? I said, how do you judge that? Yeah. How do you measure that? Yeah. Without not having a tradition to tell you of that. They said, well, that's not that important. I said, but it is though. And they said, well, do these people really exist? And I went, yes, because I fear Allah. I'm here in this room and I fear Allah. And there are better people than me out there. And I've met them. And so... You've just reduced a tradition to information that you saw on paper. Yeah. And I said, that's not the way that our tradition worked. As I told you before, our tradition was written and oral. And there was a particular ihtiram in the tradition, in the way that you speak of people, mm-hmm. even if they're people you don't like. They so have rights. They have rights, exactly. We have rights, <clears throat> they have rights. And the rights of the dead, you know, are, are really important in that sense. So this was an intriguing point. The, the, the issue of uh, your up your worthiness of talking right. as a Muslim when you're going to talk about Islam the one of the first points that we're going to ask is who is judging you right. if you don't believe in God if you don't believe in Allah and you don't believe that you'll be judged on the day of judgment then your words about Islam your fatawa are unaccept- they're not accepted if you discover something demonstrable we accept it. Mm-hmm. That's the big difference. We will accept the finds of, a, of an archaeologist, whether he's a Kafir or a Muslim. But his analysis is something totally different because now that's going through a filter. And that's what we have to separate. The historian is not going somewhere and discovering an objective fact. He's, he's taking snippets and sewing them. And essentially, it's, it's in, in essence very similar to a fatwa yeah. in the sense that he is telling you, believe this about your past. Whereas a fatwa is telling you, worship your God like this, avoid this and that. I think believing something about your past is really important too. It's a testimony. Your testimony is out. Your, your analysis is out for us because you don't fear what we fear. We can accept your commentary on what happened in an earthquake, your journalism, your history of your secular history. But once you start talking about sacred history, like the origins of Islam, or what sacred figures did to us, for us, like who we consider has rights, 
in the sight of Allah like our Salaf, we're going to interrogate your personal motive and your personal status before we accept anything from you. We will accept from you, however, a coin that you found in the ground, a whole building. You know, the Umayyads had buildings that were covered by sand in Jordan, right? They, were, they ended up being like pleasure houses, right? They were like clubs. Umayyads were something else, and they were just covered by sand. We, how can we deny that? That's a demonstrable fact. Uh, facts only come to us through transmission, through sense perception and, and demonstration, what we call science, and through reason. You can be whatever faith you want if you bring me something demonstrable or rational. The equation on the board, whether you're Hindu or Muslim, doesn't make a difference, right? It's an equation on the board. We can all judge it. A discovery that you discovered, hey, well, I went to Damascus and I found a coin from the Umayyad era. The coin's right in front of us. We're not going to reject that. Now, for you to come and sew together a thesis, see, you stop right here. Now, you can talk all you want, okay? But we're not listening. And here is where I went through this very similar things to you. I took the Islamic classes at Rutgers, Islamic studies courses, taught by Zindiqs. This is Zindiq. His name was Zaman something, right? Mm -hmm. Professor Zaman. You, I don't know if you went to Rutgers. I don't know if you remember Professor Zaman, right? There was Professor Zaman. There was Professor Namal Huck. Namal Huck. He was like that type of uh, Desi uncle. Mm -hmm. He was a very smart guy. Trained in England. He loved Islam. He really did love Islam, except he had his own thing going. We. He took us to his house one time, and uh, he said, "I know that you pray." I need to tell you, when I pray, I get so um, enraptured that it may trigger a heart condition. So I don't have to pray. <laughs> I was like, I was like, I've never heard anyone bring it like that, right? Like he gets so enraptured with Allah that it can trigger his heart condition. So he gave himself the rukhsa. No salah is obligatory. Huh? Uh, yeah, it's a matter. Yeah. So, anyway, these are the professors. I'm thinking to myself, this doesn't need to be changed, right? But then very quickly I realized that it's not going to be changed using these methods. Their, their power doesn't come from their thesis. Their power comes from the institution that's allowing them to talk. It's, it's about, this is about power. It's not about facts, right? If, I, if, if we have jidal with a group of fuqaha, I can act, we can argue on ilm yeah, yeah. and I know they will submit to evidences or at least we can talk about the evidences but if you can't even say the word Allah in the field why am I afraid to say that right it's because there's an entire institution backed by an entire civilization so the way that this is to be undone is going to be by brute force and power mm -hmm. as opposed to playing the game within their sandbox and I, I said this earlier, Orientalists, they built a sandbox with their rules and then they declared victory inside that sandbox. They declared victory therein, right? That's an, in, sorry. Yeah. That's an interesting point, which is when you, it's not just the institution like one university or here, it's a machinery, right? So as a historian, as you said, when the rules are already made, I, I've already restricted myself as a Muslim to the rules of the other side Arbitrary rules. in the way that they speak of me and I've accepted the rules and then I've and what what you see what, what happens is when those rules are narrow mm -hmm. when those rules have a lot of holes in it like Dutch cheese yeah. when those rules have a particular th the way that the system is designed is to have an opinion of you as if you are an object yeah. because one of the things about the West when they were colonizing the world and so forth they came to the conclusion that they are the power that has the right to judge everyone else, mm -hmm. every other civilization. Yeah. And when you go into that machinery, you are not given the permission to write from your own perspective, that you have to write from a perspective of their gaze on you. Even if you said you have Muslim professors, it's irrelevant now. Yeah. You can be a religious Muslim and still not write the things that you mm -hmm. want to write. Yeah. So I've said this before, like... Look, an example in, in uh, I think one of the journals of Islamic studies you can't use the word Allah it's the journal of Islamic studies so what other name why, who would who would get confused who right. right right that's why you know when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَمَنْ يَرْغَبُ عَمْ مِلَّةِ إِبْرَاهِيمِ إِلَّا مَنْ سَفِيهَا نَفْسَهِ no one goes outside the way of Ibrahim except someone who, who belittles himself mm -hmm. no one willingly enters into this playground and plays that game of theirs 
and writes history according to their rules and their style, except someone who is throwing dirt in his own face, who is humiliating himself willingly. So it doesn't matter if you're Muslim and you're trying to attain an Islamic uh, or, or the right uh, uh, conclusion, the fact that you accepted these rules and these presuppositions, you, you've dropped in all of our sight. Like, why would you even accept this, right? And let's not forget the isnad of Orientalism, of the study of Islam. What was its original purpose? Was it not originally a political institution, a military-connected institution, to go study the people so that we can conquer them? Was that not the origins, right? Is that not the origins of SOAS as a government school to go and study people before we conquer them, right? So uh, that's the isnad of that. So all of this goes back to the concept that when when someone, an outsider, is writing about you, in Islam, our concept in Islam, we interrogate the individual and his motives, right? Can I just add to this? Yeah. So that's what I mean. So history, I keep telling my students, is ideology. Mm-hmm. A historian, so I've said this before in many talks here, that I was told by a family member, mm-hmm. who's going to pay you to think? Yeah. Because in our communities, we, 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 we focus on the STEM. Mm-hmm. The STEM subjects are more important, go get a job, get married, make money. And they gave away the agency yeah. of their own identity to somebody else to talk about them. Then they come to me and say, did this actually happen? Did the book that I just read, is that actually true? I'm a human being, I'm not a machine. Yeah. How, many, how many fires am I going to put out because we didn't invest in writing about ourselves? And instead, we're now picking up books that we're aware we haven't written, that's coming from a particular machinery, speaking of us, and then we're looking for people to say is this true or not true the fact that we've been reduced to asking those questions that is this that's a problem right that's a problem and in that sense as i said and you've heard me say this before that alhamdulillah muslims have they're literate they've got money in this part of the world anyway and they've become knowledge consumers but where's the knowledge production and in this part of the world i see many muslims writing about muslim identity because they feel a pressure about being muslim when did they write about Islam? Yeah. And, you know, for them, it often becomes Islam is my personal religion, my quiet little space, and so forth. You're part of a large civilization that's going to continue. And you have to have, I mean, what I say about Rasul Sallam, he was front foot with his dawah. You don't see any defensive left. You don't see any apologizing. You don't see any of this stuff. Like, yeah, but you're not under front foot with the dawah. Yeah. People accepted it, alhamdulillah, if they didn't, kept going. And this sort of like confidence or the lack of is because of the lack of knowledge and the inability to, to know what is right and wrong and giving away your agency, not just to people, not just to institutions, but to an alternative civilizational project yeah. is a problem. Do you yes, understand? And, and that project, it only take, took off because you won the wars. Right. If we really analyze this, like even it's economics, it's all the same. Like what gives a dollar any power? The military that's behind it, right? That's really where, where that's where you track it back to. What gives the Orientalist uh, framework any validity? The institutions that are behind it. Well, what's behind the institutions? The great wealth that your military allowed for your country to have, and produce, and your country did produce wealth by itself. It generated wealth by um, its own genuine and good-willed means, right? In- inventions, etc. But nonetheless, backed by your military. So, when we look at the examination of Islam, uh, we're looking at a civilizational pro- project known as Orientalism, that. For anybody to say, no, 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 it's just facts, and we're putting the facts out there, it's got to be one of the biggest lies out there and untruths that are spoken, because it's totally not that. And it's, it's changed now, Shadi. Yeah. So, before, there was a harsh, sharp understanding of what Orientalism was. Yeah. It's now it's Orientalism 2.0. Mm-hmm. You, you're, you're getting a form of Orientalism with kindness. You know, one of the things that you notice in academia continu- continuously is there may be a sympathy towards Muslims, but intellectually there's an antagonism towards Islam. Yeah, you can it's, it's s- right exactly. And I, when I come to universities, you can see a nervousness in the Muslim students. Yeah. They're aware. 
that if you're going to speak haq or truth, you're going to rock the boat. Don't do that. So then if you've gone into this institution to learn, what is it that you're trying to learn? What is it that you want to do? And so you, you feel that. And, and when I go to the universities, I tell Muslims, listen, we, we have countless hadith literature. Speak the truth. Your risk is in the hands of Allah. It's not going to be affected by this. Don't worry about, am I going to get my Ivy League job or not? I, I, people might think that I'm being a bit flippant here. Mm. But, you know, I'm, Allah Ta'ala, I say, before His mercy, trust His protection. Yeah. He will protect you. And there are many Muslims in the past who have gone through many challenges for speaking the truth, for, the, for ilm of Islam, and for the sake of Islam. And I just hope that... You know, the other communities here, I've noticed, who are very front foot in regards to defending their identities, defending their culture, defending their traditions, that Muslims start to replicate and resonate in the same way, that this is a tradition they should be proud of. I mean, Can I ask you a question? What is the, uh, if, if a uh, <coughs> documentary series was announced on the history of, uh, of Mali, mm-hmm. and it turns out that the guy behind it is Dutch, and the financier is French. What's the reaction going to be, right? And is it a valid reaction? I think the, the, I mean, maybe the people of Mali, because they're subjugated, may not say much. But in this country, the reaction would be, they'll go after them. And it's a valid reaction. Why not? Because somebody else um, is writing about you from their perspective, and you know, these communities have realized that enough is enough. So why are Muslims not doing that? And, you know, I've been here for a few weeks, and there's sort of like tit for tat that happens amongst Muslims in that sense. It's low-hanging fruit. There's a bigger picture. The bigger picture is to go after the roots. The roots are the problem. You know what I mean? So We don't f- trust your motive. Exactly. Like, what, you're a French and Dutch guy. Right. Like, what's your motive? You can't love us this much, right? right? And if you do, you are weird, right? So in a religion, you love the relig- like you would accept it, right? You cannot love it and reject it at the same time, so that's out. Well, I'll give you an example. So when I was at SOAS and you would have seen this, so when our professors used to talk about Islam, they didn't care that we existed. Yeah. They didn't care they were there. There was a sense of arrogance in sticking it to us. I've heard this before. I know you're Muslim, but for now, we're just going to keep you all outside the classroom. And we're going to talk about this, and you're just going to accept it. You accept it. And I remember one time, I was given a Jumma khutbah, not at Soas, but in Turkey. And a non-Muslim entered the room, and Muslims got nervous. Uh, you know, teacher, listen, they're giving me the eyes, take it easy. It's Jumma khutbah. It's intriguing that when I'm in that environment, I have to make the, um, you know, adjustment and just suck it up. Yeah. And when I'm in my environment, I have to make the adjustment and suck it up. Like, come on, this is an issue. It's telling you where the power lies then. That's exactly what right? it is. It ends up being a power... Uh, uh, dynamic right. that's really the problem right. so I mean this is one thing that I think the woke agenda actually got right mm-hmm. the idea that people should determine their own narratives and you go after they go after with reckless abandon any man who's trying to talk about womanhood mm-hmm. right any man who's any uh, uh, non African uh, American talking about African American history you will be chased down Rightfully so, right? When is this going to spill over to Islamic Studies Department? We don't trust your motives, right? Mm -hmm. The the only motive you can have is destruction. Like you're trying to take this down and apply your filter onto our history. And I loved what you said earlier too. I think you said this on Friday. History is truly not about writing the past. It's framing your identity so that you can power forward. So if I framed for you a destructive identity that makes you feeling suspicious of your past, uh, down about your past, then I have hampered you moving forward. What else does, does the colonizer want? Yeah so, yeah, so this is something that really triggers me in the sense I said, don't let somebody write about who you were. Don't let people write about who you are. And don't let people write about who you ought to be. Mm-hmm. Right? And this is exactly what's happening. And uh, much of history writing, and we know this as historians, is as much as it is, it is about the past, it's about the now. Because when you see what questions people are asking, 
because history is a large repository. Yeah. Why are you making the choices of studying these particular topics? Why are you asking these particular questions? Because it interests you now. What is it now that's so interest yeah. interesting for you, for you to dig out about the past? Exactly. So it says a lot. When a book is published, understand what is it published for? What is the context? And so, look, don't get me wrong. There are a lot of books out there that just fodder. They just come out and there's some geek out there just writing stuff and so forth. But by and large, the machinery or the institution of history writing is not about that. It's, yeah. a, it's about a particular framework. And you see many Muslims who go into the field of history and Islamic studies and come out confused. And that's a problem, I think. Let's now uh, turn to the Q&A. Um, uh, Rai, if you could now be my red phone over there just so I can start reading the YouTube questions. I'll take Q&A from everybody today uh, on the subject of history only, uh, the historical critical method and all these uh, other things, that subtopics that we have covered today. We covered a lot. And let's now... Hmm, I like this red wall, actually. It's not bad. All right, let's take your Q&A. Go ahead, Ryan. Someone uh, interacting with someone who rejects all hadith and only accepts the Quran. So how does one justify and prove hadith using the Quran? Okay. Um, the first thing is that trace, trace back the chain of transmission to the idea of rejecting hadith. And the idea of rejecting hadith, I would say, was probably getting Muslims to reject their hadith, was probably part of the colonial project in India. They went first with physically taking you over. They physically beat you in wars. Afterwards, they want to get you convinced uh, to slough off your religion. And one of that was through, uh, literally, the, the, the first people to do this were Indian Muslims who read Joseph Schacht, right? So why don't you comment on that? I mean, to be honest with you, you're, you're more of an expert on this, but I was teaching these guys uh, an issue in that when in the Ottoman Empire, when the hat rule came about to mm -hmm. banning the hat and the clothing, mm -hmm. that many of the ulama, and one ulama, alim in particular, he was um, executed because he refused to take off the hat. Executed. Yeah. Executed. Right, he was hung for not taking it off. And his argument was, that first they take off, so for him, he said clothing was a uniform mm -hmm. which shaped you in the way that you behaved. Mm -hmm. So the colonizers, first they take off your uniform, then they get inside your mind, yeah. and then they get inside your heart. Mm -hmm. And so that, a lot of people don't realize this, but if you look at any photos in the 19th century of anybody mm -hmm. in that part of the world, they had their heads covered. Yeah. They had them covered. And that was an intriguing idea that they were using methodologies of bit by bit of stripping people away to only leave them an the, the notion that the Quran is it and nothing else. Mm -hmm. So the clothing, like so, history is interesting because if you see the the majority of the attacks on Islam yeah. that take place take place via the, via history. You Muslims did this. Mm -hmm. The Muslims did that. You didn't know this. You didn't know that. So it's intriguing here as a historian. I mean, in terms of hadith, you're you're far more knowledgeable than me, and I'm actually learning a lot just by listening to you. But um, it, it it was comprehensive in the way that they stripped Muslims of all agency of everything mm -hmm. in that sense and this is why the ulama for me are important I say this all the time living tradition you see it and you know how to behave and act because not everybody has access to go to the books and when you can see that and when that is stripped away from you then the, the, the community comes absolutely dislocated mm -hmm. is the word I use completely dislocated yeah. you have no continuation and no tr details of who you are and and it is the sunnah that brings us together now from the quran allah ta'ala commands us to follow the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam very brief uh, refutation of quran the quran only philosophy and there's a brother here his name is refuting orientalists and i uh, i haven't started watching his videos but i do plan to watch your videos he sent them to me um i believe he's out of india but we are commanded in the Quran to follow the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Quran itself was preserved. Where who who preserved the Quran? Physically, who preserved it? Right? Was it it was it not the companions? Yeah. Well, when the companions died, what happened with the Quran? Who preserved it? Of course, Allah pre it preserved it, but He used humans, right? He used publishing houses. He used scholars. Those same scholars that you are accepting their preservation of the Quran preserved the words of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
who preserved the Arabic language. Why, how are you going to understand the Quran? I'm going to get a dictionary. Who wrote the dictionary? Right? Why are you trusting the words of the dictionary? So you're trusting the preservation of the Quran. You're trusting the preservation of the dictionary, the lexicons in the Arabic language, but you're not trusting them on the Hadith of the Prophet. When a witness takes the stand and the prosecutor and the defense recognize them as a valid source, the jury must accept everything he says. He cannot accept the time, the glove, the testimony on the time, the testimony on the glove, but not the testimony of who it was that was wearing the, 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 holding the knife. No. If both sides accept the, this witness, you accept everything from the witness. This is why I said assessing fact from fiction is a rational thing. It's like everyone on the earth has the same, will use the same faculties built into us. That it's, Imam al-Ghazali puts it like this. He says that when we assess the truthfulness of a report, it's very similar to going from hungry to satisfied. You slowly get there, but there is a point that you are absolutely certain you're satisfied, right? And, it's just, and, and hunger and a satisfaction, it's the same worldwide, right? You're going to eat, eat, eat until, okay, I'm satisfied, right? All, this person said it, that person said it, it was verified by this, verified by that, we're satisfied, right? And it's quite arrogant, you know, because like over a prolonged period of time, you have yeah. all, like all the ulama, all the ulama are using this methodology which they endorse it mm-hmm. across the globe, in every corner of the world, that they don't know each other across time and yeah. space. And then today, somebody comes along, it's quite, there's a sense of hubris here and mm-hmm. laziness. And I find that absolutely... Um, appalling actually yeah. that you can just say well that's irrelevant now because mm-hmm. today is inconvenient to me you're reducing a you know a whole dean and i use the word dean deliberately here to to just that that part and you're reducing rasul sallam yeah. you, are, are you i always find it strange when i say are you just reducing rasul sallam as a mouthpiece for quran and quran only mm-hmm. I mean, this is why we say Quran, we, and we say Quran Sunnah, like they connect it. We, yes. r- when you listen to people, they say Quran Sunnah, it rolls off like that. Mm-hmm. So this modern phenomena, which is a phenomenon m- more so now, and it's being pushed around that comes out of the fields of academia, um, is interesting because people have internalized this, that it's okay to critique the ulama, mm-hmm. But it's, but I'm going to take something from academia, even though we've just explained that the whole culture has, has huge problems in it. Uh, let me tell people this. When you look at something, you can examine its evidence for evidence, point by point, methodology by methodology, etc. There's another way to assess things, and this to me is the divine scorecard. The scoreboard of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fruits. The great Murabat al-Hajj, the Maliki scholar Murabat al-Hajj, who is a Zahid and an ascetic, was invited by a people, he criticized a group of people. He said that group, they, and they were, there was some funny business in their tasawwuf. There was a Sufi group of Malikis, but they had a lot of, you know, f- things that Murabat al-Hajj didn't like that they were doing. Excessive bid'ah. And they called it, of course, bid'ah, hasan, etc. So they invited the young Murabat al-Hajj to be with them for a couple weeks in their camp. He traveled there and he spent time there. They hosted him. And for every single thing that they did, they brought him the pile of evidence, right? As you said, facts can be manipulated. There's no such thing as just a a bare-bone fact. It's manipulated to sewn into a story. At the end... The sheikh said, okay, we've, pref- we've furnished you with all our evidence. What do you have to say? He could say, as for your legal defenses, I have nothing to say. And then he said this amazing statement. He says, Which means, I have nothing to say about your legal evidence. You're very cleverly putting evidences together. However, the true reality is by your followers. Just look at them, right? And so the true scorecard of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in the fruits. So if you believe that the Quran only is the way to go as a Muslim, then I ask you, who is preserving the Quran today? Quran only, right? If you want to learn the book of Allah in any capacity to read it, 
to get the publication of it, right? Mm -hmm. To memorize it and to read its explanations. List me on the earth today how many of those institutions, how many of those shiuch are Quran only people, mm -hmm. right? Zero. Mm -hmm. you, cannot mem you cannot get a book, pub a Quran mushaf published itself except by people who recognize the hadith. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. If Quran only is the way, and that is the truth, then tell me exactly which army was Quran only that defended Islam. You would not have the Quran if the Crusaders were not stopped. You would not even have the Quran if the Mongols were not stopped. You would not even have the Quran or any Muslims in the West if the Reconquista was not stopped. Right? Who stood up to the colonizers? Although their project has continued. We could say the Mongols project ended, Crusader project ended, Reconquista project. It ended, but not well. Okay? But it did end. Who fought? Well, the Reconquista was pushed back for 300 years. It was pushed back by the uh, Yusuf bin Tashfin and the Murabitun, then the Muwahidun. Okay? Who did all that? Who did all the work? So forget the, the debating for a second because a good chess player will just drag out the game. And that's why I like what he, From the Woods said here, power only ne negotiates with power. If I trace back Orientalism and its presuppositions, Darwinism, Darwinism will not be just negated solely by evidence. It's going to be negated when Western civilization is, is reduced to irrelevance. Because the Chinese don't buy into it, by the way. They're not into this stuff. They, they, they criticize Darwin all the time. Rest of the world is not buying into it as religion as the rest, as the way the West is. The once once Western economic once the economy once the military once the general civilization is brought down to earth, their presupposed theories will also be brought down to earth. Sure. Let's take the next question here. Real quick, guys. Shoot. Also, like the Quran only. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we could find a list of all the things that they would be excluding that they probably do. Like Eid, we know it's not there. Wudu is not there, right? Or Wudu spe specified. Mm -hmm. that, um, what about even the Hijra calendar? Would the Hijra, like, how would you know in Ramadan? Subhanallah. You, you wouldn't even know what month we're in. Yeah, yeah. What, how does the Quran tell you what month we're in? So the Quran tells us to fast Ramadan, right? That's in the Quran. How do you know where, where that month is? You are going to now propose a religion that doesn't have a holiday? Like, <laughs> okay, go tell, you know what I tell kids when they talk about Quran? I said, uh, you like Eid? Right. There's no Eid with these people, right? They say, what's oh, absurd? How do you have a religion without a holiday, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made intellectual proofs for intellectual people and communal, community and demonstrable proofs for regular people. Allah guides regular people. How does he guide? Now, let me ask just randomly. What field are you in? IT? Yeah. IT. Like, as I've always said, the common Muslim does not mean he's dumb. He's just not a specialist in Islam. He's as smart as anybody else in his field. Just not. A, when I ask you uh, to, to make, when you make an assessment about a masjid, you, you probably don't go and look at the theological points of this mosque. You just look around and see if it smells funny, right? You see start people praying on stones or doing some funny business, right? And you're like, there's no way this is Islam, right? And you see like something like, I, I've been worshiping Allah for 30 years. I know how to pray, right? This is not how to pray. I've been around the block. Allah furnishes and he makes innovations become a straight physically in your, in your eyes. You see it. When I was young, for a long time, I didn't even know what my religion was, to be honest with you. We were Egyptians. That's what I knew. We once watched, and we were watching, uh, stay up on Friday and Saturday night with my dad on the couch, right? And we'd watch hockey games. One time after a hockey game, it was in National Geographics, and they had a thing on Hajj. Now, this is the 80s. This is like 1987. This did not happen, right? He woke me up. This is us, right? This is Islam. It's a whole documentary about Islam. We watched it. I saw the Kaaba for the first time, and he's like, this is us, right? My dad was so pumped. Then it came the Shia. They brought Shia, and they're whipping, right? And I was like, oh, that's, that's definitely not part of it, right? That we, and we're like, no, that's definitely not part of it, right? Like, intuitively, you know, that's, that's got to be, there's no way God's telling people to do this intuitively you know or you're disgusted by it. like please tell me that's not us 
right? Your fitra tells you, please say that's not us. No, no, it's not us. Alhamdulillah. Okay, good. The first part was good. Going around the cow, it's wonderful, right? Smacking yourself, hitting yourself. That, and there's no way that's, I hope that's not us. And I'm looking closely at my dad and no, that's not us. I'm <laughs> reassured, alhamdulillah. <laughs> fitra, fitra, that's how you judge. All right, so let's take the next question for Dr. Um, uh, Yaqub. No. Let's go with, right, do you have anything or should I look it up here? Go ahead. Go ahead, right. Okay. Yes, tell us about your works. Tell us, do you have a website? Do you have, you said you're a recluse. Yeah. You know, you tell us, tell us about where people can access your works. Okay. He's not out there having a website, going on Twitter, uh, having battles. Living, he's living uh, in peace. So, <laughs> so I finished my PhD and I'm turning that into a book right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but actually for the last seven, eight years I've been living in Turkey and I focused on teaching. Mm-hmm. Um, I find writing really difficult. I'm not going to lie to you. It's hard for me. I come from a regular working class background, and reading is tough for me. Mm-hmm. And so pe- my students always get surprised when I said when I walk into a bookshop, uh, I get anxiety, and I walk into a library, I hate it. Mm. And all my friends are scholars, and they collect books over and over. I give books away. So I say, look, I'm done with this. You know, I've read it. I've read it 20 times. You'll benefit more from me, mm-hmm. and I give them away. But the point I'm making is I came to the conclusion only recently, in this last year or so, that I want to write for Muslims. Yep. So my idea was now, and now I've, had, I've got some time to sit down and start writing, is that I want to start publishing for Muslims. So I have my, my PhD, which is turning into a book. I've sent it into a publisher. I'm just waiting on that. So that will come out. It was on the, on the ulama in the Constitutional Revolution of 1908, looking at how the ulama in particular looked at constitutional theory and Islamic history and so forth but that's a very technical piece what I've realized more and more now is how could and the only reason why I got exposed to this is because of platforms like this when Muslims started asking questions Mm -hmm. and I started to realize okay we don't know and it's only now I'm starting to sit down and starting to to write work so I haven't written much in that sense it's just my PhD that's out there a couple of articles in newspapers and I'd publish something for Yaqeen Institute and so on but now slowly slowly I'm, I'm I'm going to be working towards writing for Muslims as a Muslim mm-hmm. in the way that Muslims ri- had written in the past. And academia is just my day. I'm not an, so I always say I'm not an academic. I just do academia. Okay. Right? In that sense. Because I want to be, uh, uh, you know, I want to write for the community. So that's why you don't see much from me. Because I emphasize much on teaching in that sense. And I, uh, that's what I did. Let's take this question. And before that, let's... Um uh, plug patreon.com slash Safina Society. If you like the stream, you go to patreon.com slash Safina Society and you be a supporter, a monthly supporter. Uh, secondly, Dr. Harris Amin, if you need laser work done on your eyes, you go to Dr. Harris Amin in Tom's River and then you come up here and you hang out with Safina Society and it's going to be a uh, medical tourism. To the, to the most expensive country in the world, but that's okay. Probably England's more expensive. Uh, but do medical tourism here. Go down to South Jersey, get your eyes fixed, and then come up to the studio and you can hang out with us. We're, we have stuff going on almost seven days a week. Okay. Now, uh, let's get a next question. Chocolate Walla. How does Dr. Ahmed feel about Huntington's class of civilization thesis? It was dismissed widely by scholars. But doesn't it seem to be making more and more sense lately? Um, when he wrote that thing, I was like, isn't that obvious? <laughs> isn't it obvious we have a clash of civilizations? But firstly, tell us exactly, define for us his thesis, summarize for it, and tell us your views about it. So Huntington's ideas was, as you said, there's a clash of civilization with Western civilization, and then predominantly non-Western civilization, but Islam in of itself. What's intriguing here is, on many occasions, Islam became reduced as the other, and many academics who were liberal at the time came to the conclusion that this is not a fair reflection of the world that we live in. There's no unified West, there's no uniformed West, there's no uniformed other and so forth. But what was interesting about while academics dismissed this idea, 
in real time, in the real world, regular people started to say, wait, hang on a minute. That doesn't make sense because they could see it. They could uh, feel it. They can express it. And for me, when I was teaching my students, I said, whether we're talking about physical wars or, phys or civilizations or so forth, in, the es in, in essence, for me as a Muslim, this is always a conflict between Iman and Kufr. Okay? And that's how I teach it to my students. Iman and Kufr. And that Kufr can be anything. It can be the Kufr of the Mongol invasion, the Kufr of the Crusades, communism, whatnot. And so long as Muslims understand what Iman is, and what I mean by this is the idea of Islam and the idea of non-Islam, and what that means. And there could be spillages, there could be crossovers, and so forth. That's fine. But you have to have, to some degree as a Muslim, a clear idea of what it is that you belong to. And, you know, so I, give, I talk about the Palestinian issue, which is interesting. When I talked about the Palestinian issue, one of the interesting things is when it was an issue of the Ummah, there was a clear marker of you belong to the Ummah and what was not part of the Ummah, right? But now what they've done is they've created an inclusionary and exclusionary attitude, which is quite different, which is, for example, inclusionary is that we belong to humanity. So Muslims are just reduced to that. They no longer exist. And exclusionary, this is just a Palestinian issue. So either way, what you noticed is in the inclusionary identity, the Muslim identity is not there. And in the exclusionary identity, the Muslim identity is not there. So what is it? how does this fit in regards to that paradigm? What you realize then is that this is not the paradigm in which we judge from. So for me, I came to the conclusion when I teach my students that look, when you're learning something, whether it's Huntington's theory or not, it's irrelevant. The Islamic theory is quite simple. There's a world of Iman, and then there's a world that's not. And you have to strive towards establishing that. Sheikhna, um, many people are asking about book recommendations, even myself, uh, Islamic history books, books on Orientalism from this perspective. Uh, what recommendations do you have? So this is the number one question I get in, 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 in this part of the world. And, you know, it's difficult. Like, you know, we started this talk with the machinery and so forth. And, you know, like I, I gave this um, analogy to the kids the other day about General Pixis and the Attack on Titans. When he says in order to, to, in order to have a convincing lie, you have to mix the truth in it. And so one of the things that you have in Western academia is these challenges. So what I try to do to people is I give them a list of books that, that, that I think are good. As an academic and a historian of myself and somebody who's a graduate, I then try to explain to them what problems I have with those works. So I don't just carte blanche give them the books. I say, okay, well, these are the books and these are the problems that I found in these books from my perspective. But overall, the machinery is what we were saying. It doesn't speak of, an Isla of Islam and our history in a way that resonates with us. And so we still feel disjointed and disconnected. And so we're at that stage right now. For the stopgap right now, I can write a list of books. Um, things don't come off the top of my head because Islamic history is so wide. So people need to tell me what they want to know. And I can... There is critique literature in academia in and of itself, to be fair. There are, there are academics like Wa'il Halak who critique um, modernity and Orientalism and so forth. Um, there are other thinkers, decolonial thinkers like Salman Sayyid and so forth that critique the way things are written. So there's a lot of work in the academic tradition. Surprisingly, Muslims know this stuff already just by their everyday experience, but don't articulate it in the same way. So I joke when I say, for example, that um, Dave Chappelle is a vernacular intellectual. He, he, he's saying nothing different than what's being said in the academic books. He just makes it real for people in, in society so they can understand. So we have those experiences. I guess what we're looking for is those books which are lacking. But what I can do for the stopgap for now is I can help by making a list of books where, and, and help people navigate that. But in the long term, what I, and the point of this podcast was to encourage people, to encourage people to write our own works from our own voices, with our own criticism and so forth. Just a, a quick follow-up on that. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good. Quick follow-up on that. Um, just for example, I'm sure you've heard about it, uh, Lost Islamic History, mm -hmm. Ismail Khatib. Mm -hmm. um, this is what I'm familiar with in Islamic history. Mm -hmm. And then also in Sira, I was wondering mm -hmm. if there's anything, um, you know, there's the uh, Muhammad from the 
authentic sources, I believe it's called. Is do you, do you have anything to say on these? So Firas al Khatib's book is, uh, um, it's a general primer. Um, I'm I'm sure he his intention was not for it to become as popular as it did, and I'm sure he has, you know, many positions in which he would like to write something better. But it, it, what it tells you is the lack of something. The fact that that book became so popular mm. is an indication of an absence, mm. right? That that's that's the book that people always turn to, um, in that sense. So I, once again, that's an indication. As for the critique of that book, I think it was written at a particular time where um, it did a particular service. But we need to kick on from that, and and you know, there's no criticism to Fidel in that sense. In regards to biographies, I always remind everyone that the main bi- first main biography of Rasul Salam is the Quran. So people mustn't forget that. Whenever people ask me what biography, say read the Quran actually to understand that you know I when I was in Syria when I used to live there there used to be an alim who used to he used to teach Sirah in the order of revelation and then go along and, and teach it in that way. It was beautiful. I've never seen that done before. So that was one but for my students who are studying English and so so forth, there are many Sirah books in English nowadays. I mean I use Muhammad al Ghazali's Fiqh Sirah. I like that because it explains something. And then even Sheikh Bhutti's uh, Jurisprudence of Sirah is, is not a bad book. And I try to use them together in that way as a way of helping. So, um, yeah. What did you cover so far? Book, um, book recommendations. recommendations. Uh, let me talk to, say this about the motive issue. Amazing story about uh, that Sheikh Nuh Saunders gave us Sunday about Habib Muhammad al Haddad. Just an example of motive. He came out and he went to a certain area called it Bayda, and he started doing da'wah. And he enjoyed immense success doing da'wah. Right away. It was fire. So much so that the scholars then said, uh, uh, well, well, he got arrested. He got arrested, and he went through a, a trial, and he came out of it, and he returned to do his da'wah. So the scholars wrote him a book, uh, wrote him a letter, one of the scholars. And he said that, we were worried about you when you had all that success because it was like you're getting success right away so we were worried that some insincerity and love of the dunya love of the popularity would become your motive we we didn't know what's where your motive was until you got arrested and you went through that trial and then came out still doing dawah now we know that your motive is good like now we know that you're not doing it for the popularity you're not doing it for anything else the love of people, etc. So that's the concept and idea of that part of our religion is the issue of the motive, right? The, so the, his, the, the historian is not some uh, machine uh, who is purely objective. Everyone has an agenda. Uh, someone had asked something about Ottoman, what is this? Ottoman Messel? Was Ottoman Messel perfect? What is this? What are they saying? Majella. Majella. Majalla is what? A newspaper? The Majalla is a, a, a civil code book that the Ottomans created. Mm. So this is an interesting... So basically, for the Majalla, for those of you who don't understand, is that in the late... Ni- in, in the 19th century in particular, when the Ottomans are getting involved in international law and borders are being defined and the world is changing in regards to trade and so on, that in terms of civil law, initially, there was an assumption that these laws were positivist laws and so forth. So what the Ottomans did is they created a book, a primer, on the issue to do with trade and civil law from the Hanafi perspective. And there's a section in it which says that, you know, that law has been borrowed from other parts of the, the field of jurisprudence. People assumed that that was the other schools of thought. It wasn't. It was from Orf in, in particular. Um, drawing from the ideas of Ibn Abidin, the Hanafi ju- jurist from Damascus. And they created a book, which is a one-size-fits-all, because the scholar at the time, the justice minister, Alim Jevdit Pasha, was under the impression that there were not enough qualified scholars across the empire that were able to adjudicate law in civil matters due to the introduction of the changing conditions of the 19th century. So he created a one-size-fits-all primer for them. The problem is, is some of the ulama complained about this because they believed that the book format would take away from the format of the use, the judge using their own jurisdiction and so forth. But since then, it's become an accepted um, 
form of, of law. It was used in many parts of the world for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And then after the nation state was formed, many of the nation states removed that. Um, they still have it in the southern state of Johor Bahru, um, in Malaysia that they still use it. Um, parts of Afghanistan had it for a while. And it was intriguing when the Israelis had occupied Palestine, that they, they were the, the nation that used it the longest in mm -hmm. the region, because they didn't have another law code to use, and they were using that, which is interesting. Um, which they took from the Palestinians. So you, it's an interesting uh, study that people do on that. And there's an academic by in here in America called Sami Ayub. He's sort of written about the Islamic origins of the Majelle because many previous academics made the argument that it wasn't Islamic, but it was a secular law code. But it was because it was a book of codification, and that was new. I got you. Uh, let's bring up this subject. SH says, is it fair to cr criticize Muslims rejecting the historical critical method about the Islamic sources yet to embrace its conclusions on the Bible being corrupted. Now, here's, here's my first answer, then I'm going to give it to you. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said earlier, the premise of history is separating fact from fiction is a rational endeavor. It should be the same everywhere. The presuppositions are what is, uh, we can attack. The presupposition is something that is not a rational basis. You just believe it. You may have your reasons for believing it, but for the, for the Western Renaissance onwards, historians, it is suspicion towards any religious institution because we were lied to by the Catholic Church. Therefore, we go to the Japanese religion and we, we have the same attitude towards their authorities. Your authorities are trying to dupe you. Like someone who got abused by their parents. They think all parents are bad, right? That's, a, that's really the summary. That's really what I believe about the, what, what, the, in the relation of the Renaissance thinkers and Catholicism. It's that complex, right? So that presupposition is what we cannot accept. We, don't, we, we have no reason to, to, to suspect our original scholars uh, of duping us. Do we have that? Firstly, our, we don't have a church. All of our hadith and Quran was a public endeavor. Anybody could go and become a muhaddith and study and, and, and come to critique Rijal. Who was Bukhari in the first place? A boy from Persia who, because this endeavor is public, went, studied with the Persians, then studied in Mecca and Medina, wrote in Medina his first book of Rijal mm -hmm. at the age of 17. You couldn't have done that in the Catholic tradition. You would have to have signed up for the organization with an, a specific organization. There's no free-for-all. So the way I would look at it is that we don't have a presupposition that the Bible is corrupted. We have a fact that it's corrupted. Mm -hmm. Not only a fact that it's corrupted, and, and it's not something that is a taken on faith. It's, it's demonstrable. Well, show us the original Bible. You don't even have it in here. It's an original language for us to assess if it's corrupted. Where is the Syriac Bible? It was in Syriac. Where is the Syriac Bible? Right? You don't even have it to prove it was corrupted. You have translations of translations of translations. So upon that, what the uh, critics of the Bible will tell you are just the details, that we think the author of this book uh, is the same as the author of that book, and we need to get Adi Atai on here, right, to do this, because he's the expert on this, right? And you say, oh, well, hold on a second. You just said that nobody should tell your history except those people, right? And I don't accept... Every non-Muslim talking about the Qur'an should be shut down, right? Then why would I accept for Ali Atai to talk about the Bible? Because I'm not here to defend your Bible. I'm here to defend the Qur'an. I would not accept it for me, right? If... What's that? Say, thank you. Sayyidina Isa is our Nabi. You are lying about our Nabi. Al-Injil. We are awla bil Injil. The Injil, we are awla. We are more worthy of the Bible. We would honor the Bible more than them. The Bible's just put in like, I go to, to a pizzeria and I see Jesus' picture on the toilet, like on the bathroom, like in a frame. Like, wait a second, what? I want to take it down. I don't even believe in it, right? I literally took it and I put it somewhere else. Even, we don't depict Sayyidina Isa. We don't believe in that, right? You, I still took it from, this is pizzeria. I took it down. I would not accept it, right? The Bible's our book. 
in the sense that it is the word of Allah, not the current Bible, obviously. So we, we have a concern for it. So we can't speak on it. Uh, secondly, let's hypothetically say it was something totally different. Then Christians, defend yourselves. Stop him, right? I'm not going to stop him for you from saying the truth. You stop him. So that's my response to how the historical critic, the, 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 the presupposition towards Christianity was true. It doesn't apply to Islam. That's why we're not accepting the presupposition that we take with suspect the authoritative religious uh, narrative. For me, um, the issue is the Quran and the Bible are just two different books that have two different traditions and operate in two different ways. Actually, the historical critical tradition was a way of critiquing the Bible that we Muslims didn't invent. It was invented from your own tradition. That's what you did. We had a different methodology in regards to the Quran when Quran is collected, it is step by step, every single single way, we have a particular historical record the way we did that. They're, they're like apples and oranges. And the, the idea of comparing the Quran to the Bibles, to some degree, is 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 not helpful. I mean, only now, in, in the more modern period, a comparative could be the idea of the translations of the Quran. right? But even then, source proper, we still say that's the Quran, that's a translation. And there are problems regarding translation because there is a power in regards to translation. Either you have a literal translation or you derive meaning from translation. And if you're deriving meaning, that's where the issue is. So this is, and that's different from tafsir. So in regards to the way the Quran is as a book and historically how it's collated and, and it stands, it stands alone, independent from that methodology. And that methodology was designed to actually go after its own Bible. So these are two different books, and I think Muslims need to be aware uh, how the, the history of the Bible is, how the Bible operates, and how it, what its function is as, as a book, and what the Qur'an is. And I think that's, sometimes I ask my students, and they seem to assume the Bible and the Qur'an are, are the same. I said, no, these are totally different books in the way they operate. This is verbatim, the words of Allah Ta'ala. The Bible doesn't make that type of claim. These are the words of Allah. So in the way that the Qur'an is compiled, collected, and, and, and stands, it's different. And I think we need to understand that. Was there any time when the Orientalists deemed the Qur'an a book that is um, unreliable? I mean, they've tried to attack the Qur'an on many occasions. And but they still do. But what's interesting here is they fail. Mm-hmm. You know, the Qur'an stands independent still. So this is what's intriguing as a historian is you realize that actually the way they go after Muslims is not Qur'an. Yeah. It's by other methods and means, mm-hmm. right? Because the Qur'an itself stands independent. And every time they've gone after Qur'an, it stood independent. And it stood independent from us. And even Muslims, you know, they, they have had a critical eye on their own tradition. But the Qur'an is stood independent. And I haven't, seen, I haven't seen a successful Orientalist to this date, even before they made all, all types of assumptions. And you've spoken to Orientalists. Mm-hmm. What's intriguing is... They make assumptions in the way they speak of the Qur'an and the minute they come across a Muslim who knows what he's saying, they, they just crumble. Consistently crumble. Just write anything like it. And I'll, So I'll give you an example. When I was in Syria once and I was learning Arabic and I've said this to the guy, a friend of mine who's a Christian Arab came to me and she said to me, how can you follow a book you don't understand? Now at that time I was a young kid, I didn't understand much and I got really annoyed. And because in England, that would be a triggering question. Mm-hmm. So I turned to her and said, how can you follow a book you, don't under- you do understand? Mm-hmm. How can you not follow a book you do understand? And she just looked at me and walked out of the room. That's amazing. Right? That is a great answer. And this was the, in- the, the point. And she came back the next day and said, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to offend you, but blah, blah, blah. I said, no, it's fine. But can I just ask you a question? My question still stands. Because now you're asking me, I don't understand. So I'm asking you, you understand it, right? Mm-hmm. Explain it to me. Whose words are they? Yeah. Are they not the words of Allah Ta'ala? And they also just, I don't want to talk about this. Mm. And this is not me trying to be aggressive. It was me trying to learn. And this is what I mean. When, when you see people talking about Quran, I mean, they, the, the critique culture collapses overnight. And Muslims are exceptionally robust. And you can see that they can't touch Quran. So then they go through these other nefarious ways, like hadith literature, like history, like m- morality and so forth, as a yeah. way of going after Muslims. And, and, you know, this is why I keep telling Muslims have a strong connection with their Qur'an. There is, um, Reese, of late, there was um, a guy who's, um, I think, a, he's, he started off as a Shia, I think he's an atheist now, but uh, he was actually my boss at, at Yale. 
and he was nice to me, right? But uh, eventually he thought I was an Allawi, right? Mm-hmm. And when I heard that's what he said about me, honestly, my heart fluttered. Mm-hmm. I was so happy that he said that. <laughs> I, f- oh Allah, bear witness, mm-hmm. right? Because Allawi is like an Arab term. It's a derogatory term of someone who loves Allah. Mm-hmm. I was like, he's, he's the witness, right? <laughs> And the witness of your of your enemy is the, is the best, as they're saying. And I was I didn't have animosity to him at the time, and I still I haven't. Uh, we left on fine terms. His name is Shadi Nasr, and he's now I think at Oxford. But he, his Arabic is powerful. He really knows his Arabic really well. I didn't read his thesis, but his whole thesis is that the Quran is not the same as what we imagine it to be. But my lay response is, uh, let's go around to the world. Pick up the mushaf off the shelves. Yeah. Same mushaf, right? So it, it, if what you're saying has any truth to it, that's why I said sometimes you don't always need to look at the evidences point by point. Look at the fruits. If your claim has truth to it, where is the divergence now? If you're saying there's a divergence, okay, if I went, if I'm trying to go north and I went one degree off, one degree off, North, straight up. I was making, I'm driving straight, but I went one degree off. After an hour of driving, I should be far away from my de- location. After two hours of driving, if I'm driving from Texas to Montana, whatever is above Texas, after three days of driving, I should be way off course, just by one degree. So where are the opposing masahif? Where is the confusion of a Muslim that's why I thought, you know, this is not really worth my time. This argument, this attack on Islam is not really worth my time. Because where's the result? If there truly was a divergence, as he says, that should have trickled down and there should be like four, five, six books. Right. There is another one. He's a German, right? A German guy on Twitter. And I'm thinking to myself, what is your business? Bro, you should be, this, this person should not be talking at all. You have no interest. You're not a Muslim. What is your business talking about our book? Okay. Um, I w- go do that with the Torah or with Israeli sources. See what will happen to you. Your life will be shut down so fast you don't even know what happened to you. If you went and tried to do uh, what the games you're playing with us with Israeli sources or their original history or what have you, your life will be shut down completely. All right. Um, faster than Kanye's. <laughs> Kanye has been shot. How many billions has he lost for, for talking about just a word he said on a podcast, right? So in any event, uh, their attacks on the Quran, the problem with it is that where is it? So when I go to South America, when I go to Pakistan, give me any Muslim nation, throw me in any city in the world, any city in the world, within an hour I could be in a masjid, right, with the technology that we have today. And within an hour, I will have the Qur'an in my hand. It's the same Qur'an. You give me hafs, warsh, duri, right? Even the qira'at, what they bring us. 99% of the musahif on the shelves of the world are between hafs and warsh. And that's the practical reality of things, right? So the attacks on the Qur'an, they, f- they fail on that pract- uh, standpoint. That there's no fruit of it, right? And you won't go into a masjid and actually find any debate on the Qur'an. So that's why, they, as you said, they have to go on the hadith. All right, let's take a couple more questions and then we'll be finished. Uh, would you say that Orientalism presupposes the falsity of Islam? Yes, he said that. All right, he answered that. It presupposes that God doesn't exist. Islamic history has presuppositions. Allah is judging the writing of this book. We are only justified in writing about past peoples what is good about them and what we can benefit from them. Of course, if, they're, if they made a public blunder, we can talk about the public blunder like a khalifa or some a sultan or whatever. And three, okay, what is the third one uh, that I said? Is that the subject has rights. Sultan this, sultan that. He has the right. His private life is off limits to us. We can, we can talk about his public policies and we should. Everything should be on the record, exactly what he said, and we should analyze it. Okay, but his pub, his private life, that's off limits. The, the dead have rights over us. Um, I think that Nafiz is telling us, or Nafiz is telling us that he's at Harvard, and I think that 
there was a brother um what was his name who 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 went back and forth with him if you're huh what's that uh, no he's farid right you know what's his, is this name farid yeah he's a sal- he's a salafi activist on twitter but he he went after shadi nasser and he uh, went toe to toe with him i guess uh, that's what it seemed like to me showing here's a pdf here's what the quote is in your book but here's what I think it was like um, uh, it was uh, Tabari actually said. So he has videos on that. Again, I never actually went into this because the fruit isn't there, right? You're you're showing us a divergence. All the entire ummah has arrived at the same spot after all this time—a millennium and a half, a millennium. People don't understand what that means because the word fourteen hundred years has been said so much. But a millennium, the United States has only been alive for like one third one fifth of islamic history one fifth a millennium and a half and we have arrived at the same location with the quran now go we show me in the tafsir let's go back 700 years let's go back 1000 years and give me 10 tafsirs from a thousand years ago the same book right so we know that it's the same book so on the ground, there is no evidence for what you're saying. And that's more powerful than for you to give me a manuscript here and a, a, a dhamma there. <laughs> that's, that's the terrible argument, right? That, that's not moving the, the, rate, the needle at all. That does not move the needle at all, right? Can I just say, in, just really shortly, in our tradition, the ulama didn't feel the need to continuously facilitate this. So I was reading the works of Mustafa Sabri, I read it often, and he said, the day that the alim becomes encapsulated by the feelings of the mob yeah. then that's the day the alim is lost yeah that's called the sh- uh, Sha'bawi thing right that. right yeah. so the only time the ulama used to get involved in these debates is when it was a real sickness in the community mm-hmm. but apart from that uh, you're going to be putting fires out all the time yeah. and then you're going to be occupied by these things rather than the real work mm-hmm. the, the, these things are just attempts to try to keep Muslims busy so that they can't do the real work. I'm not saying not to do this from time to time in your communities, but just be aware that continuously feeling the need to continuously prove your existence, you don't need to do that. Okay, just start working on your tradition for your communities and strengthen yourselves. You don't need validation from academia about your existence. You don't need that. And the more you start getting involved in this all the time, it it really takes you away and it takes the best minds away who just constantly... It's like a quagmire. They yeah. just get dragged into it, and that's all they're doing. And then on this podcast, on this, that podcast, can you keep on? Bu- 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 and you just see these. Just, you, we're draining the life out of these people because mm-hmm. we, as a community, are not taking responsibility of what's actually important in life. Yeah, and, and you know the funny thing when you say about that is that I would say that a good percentage of the students of knowledge in our community. Uh, this stuff is like the enter. This is the break. This is the 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 the, the peripheral um, thing that they may pay attention to when they're taking a breather. That's because actual Islam and Islamic communities, we have meat and potatoes. We have Quran to study and memorize. We have dhikr to do. We have tahajjud to get up for. We have khidmah to do. We have shabab and youth to to cater to. We're busy. We have a soup kitchen. We got. Fiqh to be learned, right? Aqidah to be learned. That's the meat and potato that is a positive. So which makes you ask to these groups, again, where is the positive that you're bringing to the world here? Like you're all in the de- deconstruction. It's all just destruction. All right, last question, Rai. You bring it up for us. What is the last yeah. question that we have here? I Shoot. This is a good question to take. Yeah. I'm not being heard right now, so. Yeah, I'll repeat it. No problem. Mm-hmm. On that note of, of mentioning your own work instead of just deconstructing other things. Yep. Um, what can we learn from uh, you know the what your your studies in Ottoman history and things like this? So as I said, um, my own work is I'm looking at the ulama. So one of the things that I notice in late Ottoman history in particular is the narrative of the ulama is absent. So um, I'm trying to in particular write works about the ulama to, as a way of 
reminding people of the relevance of the ulama as part of their memory. And as I said, there's a huge bl- like blind spot regarding that period. And these people are important to us. They produce wonderful works, but they were very active. So I did collect work on writing on a particular alim called Mustafa Sabri. And then I realized I was too young to write his biography, so I backed off. I, di- I felt I didn't have the, the sort of like sensitivity to be able to give him a fair shout. But at the moment, my, like I said, the book I'm working on is on um, the role of the ulama of the 19th century. That's one. I'm waiting for that in terms of publication. These things are very slow. And the new project that I've started on is the impact of the Ottomans on the Asiatic society in the 19th century. So that's Malaysia, Japan, Afghanistan, and so forth, to try to see that how the Ottoman Empire in particular was the center of the Muslim world, but what sort of impact it had on non-Muslims that are non-Western as a way of seeing how um, Islam was was um, sort of like understood in that time. People would be surprised. I said, you know, there's, there's a lot of Islamic history in other parts of the world that people know very little about. Um, so that's what I'm doing in terms of my own work. So, um, yeah, so, and that will be held to a particular standard and people will scrutinize it in the way that I scrutinize other people's work. And that's okay. In terms of the um, the TV show, Abdul Hamid II, um, it's... They've tried to stick to um, the history as much as they can because there's a lot more evidence on the reign of Abdul Hamid. So that's why some people didn't find it as interesting as Arturul because they, they could be less, what you could call, licensed to, to move away from that. Um, but it's still TV. And I, I have to highlight that, um, you know, we've been speaking about history in, in the books, but television is no different. So when you're watching, people shouldn't, if they have to be careful of taking books as being an authority, they have to be twice as careful in terms of when they're watching TV or movies mm-hmm. as being an authority. This is a person's life, like Malcolm X put into a three-hour snippet. And so what then you expect people to be is a bit more rounded. But it's not a bad TV show in that sense if people want to just get a general interest in the reign of the Sultan. One last thing. I think like, Allah puts different people in different places of service. Mm-hmm. Right? So one person might be working, giving da'wah, and you're working you know, behind the desk What's an advice that you can give us from your window, looking at the Ummah, and everyone else in the communities? What's an advice from this perspective? I'm going to give the, a, a piece of advice that someone gave to me yesterday, and I really appreciated it. I mean, I use this analogy that we're all parts of a clock. Some pieces are just bigger than others, but all the pieces need to work together for the clock to function. And I, I, and I believe that. And somebody else said to me that, you know, if, if the Ummah is a body, different people are different organs and different parts of that body. And so this is how they they function and operate. And I appreciated that reminder for myself as well, because there there are times where, because I keep saying this, I'm a recluse. I like to mind my own business and so forth. Um, And the guys here today, when they pulled me out, they were telling me, you know, you don't realize, but you are actually making a difference and so forth. I can't see that because I'm so caught up in my own brain that I keep a distance from that because it's not for me to judge. but I believe this, that first and fundamentally, everybody should do... I said this before, there's no need for any of, us, any of us to defend Islam. Islam defends itself. It doesn't need that. So when I said Rasulullah was front foot, he was never defending it. But we need Islam. Mm. So in that sense, it's not. we don't need to be these type of people of thinking, I'm going to defend the deen. There's a problem in thinking that way. Islam is there for your salvation. Turn to it. And if you, whatever your capacity is in life, if it's just doing any bad at going to the masjid in a corner and that's your thing, fine. And if it's somebody else who has another capacity, then do that. What I've noticed in my life, like I said, I didn't want to do any of this. And it feels like Allah is just pushing me forward. Mm. And Allah, Allah does that sometimes. He takes people and, you know, when I was 25, 26, I was working in retail. If you said to me that I'd be sitting here with Dr. Shadi right now, I'd laugh in your face. No way, no chance. And here I am. So in that sense, you know, just try to please Allah to the best of your ability. Put your trust in Allah Ta'ala. And if you're sincere to Allah, Allah will see you as a as a necessary agent to, you know, put his work out there. And I said this to a sister who came to see me um, when we gave the talk here. And she was quite um, nervous about ilm and how do I do this? And I said, look, Imam Ghazali Rah- Rah- Rahim Allah said, that um, the, the, the worshipper is put in this dunya to worship Allah Ta'ala. 
So if you want to do ibadah and get close to Allah Ta'ala, He's not going to put obstacles in your way to stop that. That's your purpose. You might be tested in life to shape your character mm -hmm. in the way that Allah Ta'ala shaped the Anbiya and everyone else. But He's not going to put obstacles in your way to get closer to you. So ilm is ibadah. Mm -hmm. Try your best. It's not easy. It's not supposed to be easy. You're going to find challenges and moments where you feel like you're struggling, but you keep going and the benefits are in that. So... You know, whenever you have a moment and you think you can't do this, just have your trust in Allah and keep going. And because in the terms of Quran, when I was learning Arabic, my Arabic teacher in Syria used to say, this is so difficult. And then another friend of mine from Dagestan goes, but doesn't Allah say in the Quran that he's made this Quran in Arabic so that you may know it? Mm. So what's going on here? And I used yeah. to laugh, go, of course. So you know, we need to get out of our mentality and just keep pursuing it, inshallah. Let us uh, now talk about what happened yesterday, and we'll close with news on a second earthquake, this time in Antakya. And this uh, time it was a 6.4 earthquake in a uh, lightly populated part of town, uh, or part of Turkey, which is Antakya. And six people are dead. The earthquakes, to, oh, uh, the previous earthquake killed 44,000 people. So far. So far. I mean, what a number. That is so... Every home in Istanbul must be shaken by death. And it's also in... Was it Istanbul? Uh, no, it was not Istanbul. But I meant it was East. I meant Turkey must be shaken because the uh, that number counts Syria too. Yeah, that's right. So every home in that area, in that eastern part um, on, the, on the Turkey side, uh, sorry, the Syria border must have a death uh, which is extremely something that we have to keep them in our minds although you know we people are uh, now following up on this earthquake which was um, really the third if you count the 5.8 aftershock three minutes later and then there were dozens of smaller aftershocks that were not uh, five uh, 5.8 or, or or above that but this one was big 6.4 um, there were six people so far that have been pulled under rubble and they had died. Okay. Uh, I thought the earth was going to split open under my feet, recalls a resident uh, who told Reuters, uh, Ali Madhloum, may Allah accept his dua, if that's his name, Madhloum, the oppressed. Mm -hmm. He told the news agency that he had been looking for the bodies of his family members from the previous earthquake when this earthquake hit. All right, you don't know what to do. We grabbed each other, and right in front of us, uh, the walls started to fall. You actually were in. Did you feel the earthquake or no? No, not in Istanbul. You were. You weren't. You weren't in this district no. at all where it happened. Okay, so let us close with our with a dua for the may Allah Subhanahu wa Taala ease the burdens uh, of all those who suffered from this earthquake. We ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to render all of those who passed away in this earthquake, all of them, every single one of them, as shuhada. As the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that those who die with building collapse, collapsing upon them are shuhada. So may Allah ta'ala count them as shuhada and make them intercessors for their families. And we ask Allah ta'ala to grant sabr to all of the families, the extended families and the neighbors and everyone who suffered deaths. Likewise, those who may have suffered, who have not died but have suffered major injuries, Major injuries, we cannot forget them. Their lives have been altered permanently. There have been people who have lost their homes. Their lives are altered permanently. People who have lost their businesses, their lives have been altered. May Allah Ta'ala be with them and give them sabr and grant them the iman in handling tribulations. Just as we handle what is good from Allah, we know He gives it to us with the wisdom. Likewise, He, hand, he hands us uh, we receive trials and tribulations in life what we don't like and we believe that Allah has a wisdom in it uh, and our view is not just dun dunya we ask Allah to expand our view to dunya and akhirah this is the Muslim's view of, of existence is that what happens here may not have what we want of the dunya but it will have what we ha want of the akhirah and we ask Allah to increase our iman in akhirah and increase our iman in the life that is coming after this life so that we may bear the hardships of this life Lastly, we ask that Allah Ta'ala 
bless all of the Muslims who are suffering outside of Turkey, who we may have taken our eye off of at this time, and give them uh, uh, ease in their hardship and their difficulty, and for all those enemies of Islam who are harming these people, such as the Uyghurs and the, and the Rohingyans and the Palestinians, we ask Allah Ta'ala to busy the, them with themselves. All of these oppressors, may Allah busy them with themselves so they could let go of uh, and leave off their oppression of our brethren. Wa sallallahu wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Subhan rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala al